Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Neoliberal Podcast, part of the Center for New Liberalism. I'm your host, Jeremiah Johnson, and this week's episode is a mailbag episode. Throughout the year, we take questions from listeners in our mailbag. You can always send us questions at mailbag at cnliberalism.org. And in this episode, we'll be answering them on the show. As always, if you want to support the podcast, please make sure to rate, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And if you really want to support the podcast, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash neoliberalpodcast. You can also become a member of the Center for New Liberalism at cnliberalism.org slash become a member. And that gets you access to our community Slack of activists and all to all the episodes that we do here, including the special bonus episodes. So if you want to support us, then we would certainly love to have you. With that said, let's jump into the episode. Our first question comes from Marie, who asks, What would you say to young progressives or young liberals who aren't excited by the prospect of a second Biden run and who wish someone else would run? I think that's a really interesting question. This is obviously something that has been debated for a while and is now, you know, no longer in question because Biden has announced that he is formally running again. We've known this for a while, but it's been an open question for the better part of a year, really the better part of his entire presidency. People have wondered, would he run again? And the answer has always been yes. It's basically always been assumed that Biden would run again, but it's been left open enough that people could wonder, wait, what if he doesn't? He is kind of old. What if he doesn't? What I would say to a young progressive or a young liberal who's not excited by this is basically I would ask them what outcome they're looking for. I assume that as a young progressive person, they want to elect a president who will fight hard for all of their progressive worldviews, right? That's ultimately the goal of presidential politics is to get someone elected who will do things that you like. And perhaps they've been disappointed in Joe Biden and they don't think he's done enough because no president is ever perfect and they'd like someone better. But my question is, how realistic is it that you're actually going to get someone better? What outcome are you hoping for and, and how are you going to make that happen? I think that the likely candidates who would replace Joe Biden would lead to worse outcomes. First of all, I think that they're less likely to get elected than Joe Biden. Joe Biden has proven he can get elected. The Republican nominee is almost certainly going to be Donald Trump. He's the huge favorite at this point. And there's one Democrat who has beaten Donald Trump in a national election, and it's Joe Biden. And, you know, maybe some other Democrat could also do it, but we know Joe Biden can beat Donald Trump. So I don't know, in terms of electability, if you want a progressive president, the first thing that you've got to have is someone who can get elected. And we know that Joe Biden can do that. The most likely person to replace Joe Biden would be Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris is the vice president. And frankly, she would be in the best position to win a Democratic primary if it took place. But I don't think she's a particularly strong candidate. I think she would have real electability issues. And I know that's a tricky statement to say about a female candidate, a black woman candidate, but I, I think it's just reality. Whether we're comfortable with that or not, I think that she's not a strong candidate and she would really struggle in a national election. She's only ever won statewide elections in California, and frankly, winning a Democrat versus Democrat race in California is just very, very different from winning national elections as a presidential candidate. And so I think Kamala Harris in particular is the most likely candidate to replace Joe Biden. And I think that she's also a candidate that would struggle hard to actually win a national election. It could be someone else. But again, 
Joe Biden is probably the most electable candidate that the Democrats have. I think other people that would potentially slide in there would also just have electability problems, not to run through the entire list of who it could be. I would also ask this person, what do you think a Democratic president should realistically be expected to achieve? And could some other president have done more than Joe Biden? Joe Biden's administration and the Congress in the first two years of his administration passed more significant legislation than just about any Democratic president has since FDR, probably. You can argue about, you know, Lyndon Baines Johnson, LBJ, but regardless of exactly how far back you want to go, he's had an enormously impactful first two years. They passed the Build Back Better Act, the CHIPS Act, the IRA. There is just an enormous amount of like huge, these are big ticket, massive bills that do all sorts of stuff. And I give Joe Biden a lot of credit for being able to work very big, very complex bills through a very closely divided Congress because he had the experience to do so, because he was a senator for God knows how many decades, three, four decades. He had the relationships and he had the knowledge of how to guide bills through that process. I question whether some other Democrat would have been as successful as he was at that. So ultimately, again, it comes down to what outcome are you looking for? You want a president who, number one, can get elected, and number two, can push big things through Congress. I don't think there's a realistic case that some other candidate would be better at those two criteria. So that's my message for people who are, like, real bummed about Joe Biden running again. You know, this is what we've got, and this is our best chance if you're from that mindset. But thank you for the question, Marie. Our next question comes from Evelyn, who asks about the trans rights movement, and specifically, are there lessons that we can take from past social movements, like the the black civil rights movement, the women's liberation movement, the gay liberation movement? Are there lessons we can take from those movements that will apply to kind of winning the fight for trans rights? I think that there's a lot of interesting parallels here. And I think that in our current moment, we sometimes underrate the extent to which those past movements had to compromise and kind of make concessions and really accept a lot of marginal improvements and really do the hard work of, we're going to make things a little bit better a little bit at a time and do the dirty work of convincing people who we're not necessarily allies with. I think it's forgotten sometimes just how much of that we have to do. I sometimes see more left-leaning commentators, like for instance, Carlos Maza, who used to work for Vox and now is just kind of a leftist YouTuber, And sometimes these commentators will say things like, you know, oh, you know, gay people didn't, gay people weren't given liberation. Gay people, you know, took it for themselves by burning down police stations and rioting and throwing stones. And and I think that's just such an incredible misunderstanding of how the gay rights movement actually worked. Like, yes, you can find instances of gay people rioting or I'm sure there was a police station that burned down at some point. You can look at that and point and say, yes, that's a thing that happened. But that's not why gay people have civil rights right now. That's not the actual thing that caused it to happen. What caused it to happen was a long, slow, drawn-out cultural process whereby gay people just became more accepted. You saw them more and more in public life, More people started to know a gay person personally. More people saw them represented in media and television and movies and all sorts of things like that. I think things like Will and Grace 
Will and Grace was probably the single most important thing that had ever happened to the gay rights movement when it aired on television. And I don't think that's an exaggeration to just see a friendly group of gay people going about their day, getting into wacky hijinks on national television. I think it can't be overstated how impactful that was to just have there be kind of this generic, nice gay person model that regular straight people, even conservative people could point to and say, oh, that's not that scary. You know, Will and Grace did more than every gay riot of all time did in terms of moving gay civil rights forward. You can also look at similar things happening with the civil rights movement for black people in the 1960s. There's a lot of people who love to throw out the Martin Luther King quote about white moderates, where, you know, he, I think he says something like, I, I must confess that I have been disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block on, in his stride toward freedom is not the racist's but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice. And you can read that as saying, oh, well, MLK was very against the idea of appealing to white moderates. But it's the exact opposite. Certainly MLK was very disappointed in white moderates at, at points in his life, at points in his activism. But... He desperately wanted to win them over. He knew that white moderates were the key. His entire political strategy was based around, we have to win the white moderates. This movement will not succeed if we don't get the white moderates on board. They explicitly planned for this. This was the whole thing, guys. They would have literally planning sessions where when they would go do these things that they knew would get them arrested, they would go try to ride the buses in a certain town, or they would go sit at counters. They would do it with the explicit plan of getting on network television to make white moderates feel sympathy for them. They had literally planning sessions where they would say, okay, we know this sheriff in this particular town is a lot more racist. He's going to do something that will snap. He's going to assault us. He's going to turn the fire hoses on us. We're going to do it at this particular time of day. We're going to invite the camera crews beforehand. And it's this, the 1960s, so they're filming on actual film. And they know that if they do it at this particular time of day, then they will be in time for the film to be flown from like Alabama or Mississippi all the way to New York. And it will get there in time for the evening news. Like they planned all of this very particularly so that it would be shown on the national news. They strategized the whole thing. They did the logistics of getting it on the national news because the whole point was they needed to shock the conscience of the white moderate. So MLK was all about appealing to moderates, even as disappointed in them as he was. He knew that they were the key. And so... I think those are the lessons that I take from past civil rights movements when I think about transgender acceptance generally. You've got to win the average person. You've got to win the median voter who maybe is not always your friend, who maybe is not all that super comfortable with trans people yet, but you've got to make them comfortable. Even if that requires some ugly concessions, even if that requires things that make you personally uncomfortable, you've got to care about the moderates. And ultimately, once you win them over, that's how you win. How do you do that? I think that, number one, you have to be willing to plan your PR strategies around the moderates and not around activist demands. You can't plan your political strategy for trans rights around, you know, the 5% the most socially progressive people in the country. Now, most of your activists will be in that top 5% most socially progressive, but you, they have a responsibility, I think, to plan their, their plan of attack around what moderate sensibilities are. 
Maybe that means dropping certain issues, frankly. I, I think about potentially something like the debate on, on trans women in sports. This is a really thorny topic. It's one where moderates are not going to have a lot of sympathy. And I would rather focus, if I'm an activist, on the many, many other things that are way more important. Being able to get health care for minors, being able to have insurance, being able to have equal rights, you know, as opposed to can this one person participate in a sport? Again, in a perfect world, maybe we wouldn't have to be making this compromise at all. But in a world where there's a, still a lot of bigotry out there, picking your battles is important, unfortunately. I think it's also important to simply normalize trans people, whether that's media representations or simply knowing someone in your personal life. I think that whole aspect of have you ever seen a trans person have you ever met a trans person? Do you know someone who is your friend or your family member who is trans? Have you seen them represented in kind of a normal, positive way in media? That matters a lot as well. And so anything we can do culturally to just have more positive, normal views of trans people, not, not where the trans person is like doing crazy stuff, but just like they're a normal person going about their day, who is trans, that really matters. So that that's kind of how I think about this. I think we should stick to the core, most important issues, try to avoid the craziest culture war stuff, and, and continue to push for representation in media. But thank you for the question, Evelyn. Our next question comes from Nick. Nick says, I'm in a book club, and we've been reading a book called Post-Capitalist Desires, which is a transcript of a lefty lecture series. What the book fails to do is really articulate its vision for the future and how to get there. There's a lot of blame tossed on capitalism, but there's not a lot of solutions or building for what we should actually have in the future. If there was a similar neoliberal desires... What would you do to articulate the vision for a neoliberal future? This is a really good question, and I really like it. Thank you, Nick. What I would say is that neoliberalism is trying to maximize a few things in the world. I think neoliberalism is trying to maximize the amount of political freedom that exists in the world. To be a neoliberal, first and foremost, is to be a liberal, a political and philosophical liberal. It means that you are rooted in liberal democracy. And so the most important thing is that we've got to be promoting liberal democracy throughout the world, whether or not that means like we should be like aggressively doing that in like a neoconservative way. That I, That's up for debate. Maybe not. But certainly it should be a goal that we want liberal democracy to flourish around the world. And a vision of the future should include more and more liberal democracies that are healthier and stronger in their democratic principles over time. So that's the first thing, is that a vision of the future would be populated by liberal democracies where everyone is able to have political rights. That's not the case right now. There's a lot of people who live in authoritarian countries and whose political rights are very much not guaranteed, and a neoliberal future would just have more of liberalism, I guess. <laughs> I also think that neoliberalism is trying to max out as much as possible things like freedom and prosperity. Now, freedom can be tricky to define, right? I like the Amartya Sin definition of freedom, where freedom is basically defined as the ability to lead the life you want to lead. And where anything that stops you from leading the life that you want to lead is kind of an affront to your freedom. This means that governments can restrict freedom, certainly, by telling you, oh, you're not allowed to live this way, you're not allowed to be this religion, you're not allowed to speak in a certain way, you're not allowed to do what you want with your property. These are kind of very libertarian uh, concepts where somebody has restricted your freedom. But in this definition, it also means that 
being materially poor and being in poverty is a real restriction on your freedom. Libertarians would not necessarily see it that way. Libertarians have like a negative conception of freedom where it is only something that can be taken away by a big government actor or something like that. But I think that, you know, it, it is a real restriction on your life if you are born into poverty, even if nobody in particular, even if no particular actor or government has restricted your freedom, if you are simply born into poverty in libertarian paradise, but you are still in poverty, that is a real restriction on your freedom in a practical sense. You are not free to do the things you want to do and to live the life you want to live. And so I think a neoliberal society would have people who have political freedom in a politically liberal system and also have a very high standard of living, who are flourishing and have a high material wealth. And I think that really matters. Now, how do we get there? How do we get to this land of everybody is materially wealthy, everybody is free and lives in a liberal and democratic society? Well, the neoliberal vision of that future includes a world where people are free to immigrate where they want to immigrate. It includes a world where international trade is not restricted. These are some of the biggest and best tools we have to promote material wealth and material well-being. It also helps develop political liberalism, I believe, because what is better for voting against a political system that is unjust than being able to move out of it? Vote with your feet kind of a system. Ultimately, people will get the political system that they deserve if they're able to vote with their feet and move. And, and certainly that's, that's an oversimplification, but a world where people are able to move is going to be both a politically more free world and a politically more wealthy world. And I think both of, both of those things are good. I think the neoliberal vision of the world also simply includes a, a lot of technocratic policymaking where in a neoliberal future, you're simply going to have to work very hard to get the messy details of policy correct. How do we get housing policy correct? Well, we've got to build more housing. But that will mean a lot of messy technocratic details in terms of switching our zoning system, switching parking requirements and floor area ratios and planning commission meetings and, you know, going through the public hearing process. All of that will need to be kind of fixed in a technocratic way. Environmental review laws, all of this stuff is not necessarily something you can just reason from first principles what is the amount of environmental review that is required? There is no principle of that. It's just, well, what does the best job? What does the best job striking a balance between letting us build stuff and also making sure we don't hurt the environment too much? You've got to figure that out as you go. And you're going to need competent and talented technocrats and bureaucrats to help you figure that out. So I think that's part of the future as well is that there's a small army of dedicated bureaucrats who help us figure out how to implement the policies we need. The civil service is really an important part of this. So I guess I'll stop there because I don't want to, you know, try to dictate every single thing that would be happening in a neoliberal future. But I'll say that political liberalism in terms of the, the basic liberal freedoms and liberal democracy, those are very important in a neoliberal future. Trade, immigration would be just cornerstones of that as part of kind of free markets and being able to, to move with your feet and a commitment to being able to get the technocratic details right. All of those things, I think, would be really crucial to a prosperous neoliberal future. Our next question comes from Josh. And I really like this question because it actually touches on several of the things that we've already been talking about in a couple other questions, and, and we might have a chance to expand on those questions. Josh asks, anti-black racism is a large-scale problem in the U.S., and most of the anti-racism movement is generated through the left or, or far-left people, and this has caused some theories that don't particularly validate well. To step in here, you could talk about police abolition or, for instance, the, the push towards like 
DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, initiatives, those don't seem to actually work very well. Is there a version of liberal anti-racism, Josh asks? Are there thinkers we should pay attention to whose policies aim to specifically reduce the disparities between blacks and whites? This is a really good question, and it touches on the things that we've been talking about with commentary on the civil rights movements of the past, and also what does a liberal vision of the future look like? I want to say first, I completely agree that it's kind of an issue that so much anti-racist thought is generated by the left and frankly puts out wacky ideas that don't work. And this kind of gets to what I was talking about with the vision of the future that liberals have. There are certain things that you should take as kind of a given. This is a principle. I will not back down from the principle. I am simply committed to this thing. For liberals, a lot of that is the basic liberal principles like freedoms, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, et cetera, et cetera. It's principles like equality before the law, the idea that we should have democratic elections where everyone should have their political rights guaranteed, that we should treat all people equally, regardless of their race or age or gender, et cetera, et cetera. For me, those are the things that liberals should take as sacred. Those are the things that liberals should take as non-negotiable. You could also toss in there kind of a commitment to keeping material prosperity going. People should become richer over time. If people are not becoming richer over time any longer, that's a bad thing. Just about full stop, and we should try to keep it going. Now, on the other hand, when I talked about the technocrats in the last question, there are some things you simply can't reason from first principles. I have said earlier that, you know, there's... No first principle that can tell you how much environmental regulation you should do, how much environmental process. Should it be years and years of process? Should it be literally zero? Should it be something in between? You're going to have to figure that out as you go. You're trying to maximize there multiple things. You're trying to maximize both the amount of stuff you can build and the efficiency with which you can build it, but also the care that you have for the environment and the, you know, the principle of not wanting to ruin the environment when you do build things. And so you're going to have to go through a messy process of tinkering and figuring out what works empirically, you know, factually, when we put this environmental review process into place, did it actually allow us to build the things we need? Did we end up ruining the environment because we didn't do enough? All of those questions are important as factual matters. And I think that a lot of anti-racist policy or racial equity policy or just things that we do to specifically reduce the disparities between blacks and whites, however you want to phrase that, I think a lot of those policies fall into that category of you can't just first principle your way into the right policy. I think that's where a lot of these leftist ideas fall astray is, you know, they'll, they'll look at something like police abolition. And frankly, the facts don't matter. If you are a police abolitionist, it does not matter what the statistics are for police this or police that. You might use statistics, but only in the way a, a drunkard uses a, a light post, you know, for support rather than illumination. You have already committed to police abolition based on first principles. The police are just bad. Full stop, police are bad. And I'm not going to compromise with them. I'm not going to compromise with this system. We just have to abolish the police. I think that's kind of a crappy way to do things in this particular instance. And it's going to end up hurting people, including the people that you want to help. I don't think that police abolition would be helpful for any community in the United States, including black and brown people, poor people. Instead, the question of, you know, how, how many police should we hire and what should those police spend their time doing and how should they be trained and what standards should we hold them to? Those are empirical questions. Those are questions that we're going to have to figure out over time in a messy way because policing for instance, 
is something that is trying to accomplish multiple goals at once. When we institute a police system, we're trying to reduce crime. We're trying to increase safety. We're also trying to make sure that the police treat everyone equally, that the police are not reinforcing racial stereotypes or causing harms based on racist perceptions. There's no first principle that's going to tell us how do we minimize crime and maximize racial equity at the same time. We're just going to have to figure it out. We're going to have to go through the messy process of iterating and looking and seeing what policies do and then adjusting over time. Similarly, on economic policy, you know, th there's no first principle that will tell us how to minimize the black-white gap. I think here, again, we just have to experiment and see what policies factually do it. If you start from kind of a first principles point of view, you might just say, well, let's do reparations. Reparations are the only just thing and the only thing that will work. And I don't want to hear your other crap. Just we should do reparations. And I think the people who advocate for reparations typically have a viewpoint that's pretty close to that. They don't really want to hear your evidence. They just know that the answer is already reparations. And that's where they're starting from. I tend to think that we should pursue more race blind ways of lowering the racial wealth gap and, and you know, the racial income gap. This is very much a Matt Iglesias style take. But, you know, I look at something like the child tax credit. The child tax credit lowered racial inequality, not because it was designed to help black people, but because it helped poor people and, you know, lower middle class people. And a lot of those people disproportionately in America were black. It wasn't a policy that said anything about black people. It had, you know, no diversity, equity and inclusion kind of goal in its stated goal. But because it helped people who were not well off, because it helped the lower middle class, it did end up narrowing that gap. And so I think, you know, a, a strong welfare state policy that is race blind, that helps the people that need to be helped, is going to naturally close the black-white gap on its own. This is a very Matt Iglesias-style take, and I think that he's worth listening to on this issue. So that's kind of how I think about these things, uh, Josh, is that for a lot of reasons, leftist thought tends to just operate from first principle, I already know the answer, it's the only acceptable answer, and that in many policy areas, whether it's, you know, it, the black-white income gap or policing or what have you, you can't just operate from a first principle. You've got to see what actually works in the real world. And that's, that's how I would build a liberal version of anti-racist policy is that it's got to be evidence-based and we've got to see what actually works. Our next question comes from Jimmy who asks, what can normal citizens like you and I do to actually influence policy and policy makers on foreign policy? Jimmy has kind of a thoughtful letter where he talks about, you know, if I want to influence local housing policy, there's concrete things I can do. I can attend local city council meetings. I can show up at community boards and advocate directly for the housing but it's hard to do that if my goal is, you know, I want America to send more tanks to Ukraine or I want America to take a tougher line on China or, or something like that. There's no local council for that. And it's a good point. The first thing I would say is that I don't think we should underrate the power of calling your representative and letting them know what you think, showing up at their town halls and specifically talking about these issues. It can seem like a form of lazy slacktivism that you're just, oh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to phone call my representative and call their office and, you know, tell them that I care about this. And then they'll, you know, some staffer, some intern will say, OK, and thank you for your call. We appreciate it. But, you know, I, I think that's underrated. They actually do track this stuff and especially phone calls, more so than letters and more so than emails, phone calls actually called into the office, I think, are tracked by just about every single congressional member. And they see when there's a spike in this stuff. 
And so calling your representative does work to some extent. I, I think it's, you know, it's not obviously a, it's not a universal thing, but it, there are definite instances when coordinated action on phone calls has really impacted policy. And beyond your individual actions, I think that concept of collective action is really key here. You should be calling your congressperson to advocate for the foreign policy goals you want, whether that's, let's say, more money for Ukraine or whatever the case may be. But you should also be coordinating your friends to do the same thing. It makes a lot more difference if there's, you know, dozens of people calling in. If you can organize that to happen, that really can change a congressperson's stance. If dozens of people all call in to advocate for the same foreign policy goal. And if you can start an organization that does this in a coordinated way across many congressional members, you know, I, I think that's really effective. If your goal was to do the single most effective actions kind of in an effective altruist way for foreign policy, I think that, you know, starting a think tank or working for a think tank is probably one of the most impactful things you can do and really make it your job to coordinate campaigns and put pressure on Congress people to take the right foreign policy actions. I think you could also even think about getting a job in the State Department or as a congressional staffer. Those things are really influential. There's a particularly high degree of influence, I think, on issues that are not partisan coded. Like, look, if you are a congressional staffer, you are not going to be able to change your boss's mind or make any real impact on their stance on abortion, for instance. Not really. We know Democrats basically have to, 99% of the time, Democrats in Congress have to believe a certain thing about abortion. They're just going to believe it. Republicans have to believe a certain thing about abortion. It's so partisan coded that, you know, what the staffers think about the issue doesn't really matter. And I would say a similar thing for like tax cuts. If you're a Republican, you have to be for tax cuts in, in the abstract. It doesn't matter who your staffers are. The Republican is just going to be for tax c- cuts and spending cuts. But if it's an issue that is not super partisan coded, you know, should we seek a better trade deal with the EU or should we be sending weapons to Ukraine? Should we be taking a tougher line on China? Like there's a lot of foreign policy questions that are not super Republican versus Democrat necessarily. There's some of them that are like very partisan, like what you think about Israel is, is a whole complicated mess, right? I'm not even going to get into that, but that, that's a tricky one. But there's a lot of these foreign policy goals that just escape the culture war to some extent. They're outside the culture war. And on those issues, staffers in Congress, just literally who happens to be working in Congress for the representatives, they can make a big difference because the, the individual Congress people have the freedom to kind of move back and forth uh, in a wide range of you know policy views because it's not part of the culture war. They can kind of do what they want. And so that really matters too. So I would say that, you know, coordinate campaigns of pressure, phone calls, showing up at town halls, things like that, that can actually work. And then figure out how to get people, whether it's you personally or other people, figure out how to get them in the right positions, working for the State Department, working for big federal agencies, working for members of Congress, where they can make a difference. Those are the things that I think actually make a difference in terms of changing foreign policy. The next question comes from Derek. Derek sent in a note after our podcast on how to think about wokeness, where he said, I thought you might get some negative feedback, so I wanted to send something positive. All the principles were spot on and not something I had heard concretely articulated before. Well, first of all, thank you, Derek. That's that's very flattering, and I'm glad you enjoyed the episode. Derek says, I would love to hear a conversation between you and Tim Urban on the topic. I think he is much more in the wokeness is ruining the world camp, but it would be interesting to hear him talk about why he spends so much of his new book worrying about the anti-liberal left and not the anti-liberal right. 
Derek says he personally is more scared of the DeSantis's of the world than of the far left. Thanks for writing in, Derek. I appreciate the kind words, and I appreciate the kind of question. There's not really a question in there, but there's a suggestion, I guess. I appreciate the suggestion. I think there's some potential for that to be an interesting conversation. But in terms of Tim Urban's new book, which I believe is called uh, What's Our Problem?, and it is about polarization in America, I think. I guess I'm uncertain whether I think the book is is worth including on the podcast. I, to me, it seems kind of like a lesser version of the Ezra Klein book, Why We're Polarized. I, I, I also just have a really, really high opinion of Ezra's book, Why We're Polarized, and I think it would be a hard to do a better version of that. And the Tim Urban book, to me, seems kind of like kind of a knockoff version of Ezra Klein's Why We're Polarized. I, I'm not sure how much new I would get out of the book. It, it seems like the central insight of the book is, whoa, you can be on the left-right spectrum, but there's also a spectrum of crazy to not crazy. And there's crazy people on both sides. And that's true. But I also don't think that's a particularly new insight. That's not a startling revelation to me. In terms of understanding how we got to this point where the crazies on both sides have more power than they used to, again, I, I don't think anything is going to beat the Ezra Klein book for that. So I guess I'm just a little skeptical of this book as, as a real idea generator. I think these are just ideas that, frankly, have been floating around forever it, in kind of a popularized form. You know, Tim Urban is a cartoonist and, and an explainer who seems to be pretty popular, and or, or at least he was years ago. He kind of dropped off the face of the earth to write this book, I think. But I don't know. I, I would need some other push. Like, what's the angle? What's the reason I should care about this book other than just it's a guy kind of redoing Ezra Klein's work in a weirder, worse way? I'm not sure. I do agree with you that for me, I think the, the anti-liberal right is a lot more serious threat than the anti-liberal left. I think they're both worrying. I think it's worrying that anti-liberalism and kind of this weird extremism seems to be increasing on both the right and the left. But I agree with you that the right is farther down the path, clearly to me, farther down the path. So I don't know. It Maybe it would be an interesting conversation, but we'll see if anything happens there. And thanks for writing in. And our final question, which comes from Becca, is pretty short and to the point. What's your view of the fight between Ron DeSantis and Disney? And there's, there's a little bit more kind of background, uh, but I think we all have heard the background at this point. Ron DeSantis and a lot of, you know, cultural conservatives in Florida are very, very mad at Disney for being like generically too woke, I guess. I forget what the initial spark for this even was, if I'm being frankly honest. It probably was just the fact that like Disney does not want to stone gay people to death or something like that. It's, Disney is too woke in some way, and Ron DeSantis has had this campaign against them. It recently culminated, actually, where Disney is now suing Ron DeSantis in the state of Florida for basically persecuting them. They say that they're at the center of a campaign of targeted harassment by the government for exercising their free speech rights. And frankly, they're correct. That is absolutely what is happening. This letter was actually written a, a month ago. This has been dragging on for a long time. So it's serendipitous that it that worked out. But how do I think about this? I mean, look, honestly, I mean, look, frankly, it, it's obvious where I stand. I think Ron DeSantis is an idiot. And he's being an idiot and he's being a, a really evil, awful person who wants to, you know, prey on vulnerable populations, mostly gay and trans people, in order to further his weird agenda and to get elected president. He obviously wants to be elected president. He's obviously decided that the way he's going to do that, his angle, is to be this anti-woke crusader and to just, like, fight against wokeness however he can and, you know, however many gay people he has to trample along the way, like whatever. Um, so I think it should go without saying that I am not a huge Ron DeSantis fan. I think the more interesting commentary here, though, 
is how it positions Trump in the Republican primary. Because right now, Trump has declared that he's running for president. Ron DeSantis has not declared that he's running for president, but it's very obvious that he kind of wants to and that he's testing the waters. Maybe he will formally declare that he's running. Maybe he won't. But it's obvious that a lot of people either want him to run or expect him to run, that people in his camp are feeling out the process. And so there's this shadow primary happening, a shadow primary between the two big hitters in the Republican Party right now, Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis. And of course, Trump has already started hitting DeSantis and calling him names. And DeSantis is, to this point, not engaged with Trump. He's just taking it for now. But DeSantis is engaging in all sorts of stunts. You know, he's shipping illegal immigrants up to other cities, up to the Northeast, and saying, ha, you deal with them. And that's a very cruel thing to do. It's a very inhumane thing to do. But he's doing it specifically to get, like, points with the Republican primary voter base. He's fighting with Disney, and he's doing all this stuff in schools that is more than it's meant to actually accomplish anything, you know, It's meant to get points. He wants to score points with the Republican voter base so that they will think of him as a credible, strong conservative who fights against the wokeness. And this is how he thinks he's going to get elected president. He's going to win the Republican primary by being the most anti-woke. And the weird thing here is Donald Trump comes off like a moderate compared to Ron DeSantis, at least on some issues. And again... It's weird to use this language because Trump tried to overthrow the government. Trump tried to do an insurrection and he promoted that. And Donald Trump is in a lot of ways obviously not moderate. But compared to DeSantis on cultural issues, he comes off that way. Trump is more moderate on abortion than DeSantis is. He'll say things, but like apparently Trump has been complaining a lot that Republicans are going way too hard on abortion and they're getting killed on abortion and he's not happy about it. And if it was up to him, Republicans would just drop a lot of the abortion stuff. And Donald Trump comes off more moderate than someone like DeSantis does. DeSantis, who just passed a six-week bill, I think six-week abortion bill in Florida. Trump has also started commenting, relevant to this question, that DeSantis is like stupid for going after Disney. Trump is positioning himself as, well, this whole fight, like, why is DeSantis fighting with Disney? What an idiot. What a moron. Disney's great. You know, like, we love Disney, don't we, folks? We love our Disney. Great company. Like, you can imagine, I I can't really do the Trump voice, but you can imagine him going through this line of, like, we all love Disney, don't we? Let me tell you, Florida's always been great. Disney has always been great. We don't need to fight. I think Trump kind of senses that this is a weird losing fight. His political instincts are are still pretty good, I think. And he senses like this is a weirdo thing. This is a weirdo thing that Ron DeSantis is like mad that like Disney included a gay character in some movie. And so he's going to like punish them through all sorts of stuff and get in a bunch of big public fights with Disney. And Trump can kind of sense like most people just like Disney. Most people don't want to start weird anti-woke crusades. That's a minority of the population. And so the, the end result of this in a very strange way is that Donald Trump comes off as more moderate than Ron DeSantis, and he can position himself as the moderate Republican. How, how the hell is that happening? I don't know. That's, that's my insight here is that the implications of this Disney versus DeSantis fight, like who's correct is obvious here. Disney is correct. That's not interesting. The interesting part is the implications for DeSantis versus Trump. With that, I think we've reached the end of the episode. Thank you so much to everyone who sent in mail. If you want to hear your questions answered on a future mailback episode, uh, please send us a note. Shoot us a note. Tell us what we get wrong, what we get correct, what we should be talking about that we're not talking about. You can send in your questions, your comments, your hate mail, anything at all to mailbag at cnliberalism.org. That's mailbag at cnliberalism.org. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you in the next episode.